Hello, 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 everybody. Uh, it's so good to see your non-existent digital faces. Hello, and welcome to Lecture 13 of Professor Chong's Tabletop Workshop, Character Death. Uh, m please excuse my hair. I just took a shower, so it's a little poofy, a little all over the place, but hopefully that won't uh, affect the lecture today very much. Before we get started, just a few announcements. As of the recording of this VOD and the streaming of this lecture, Arc 4 Episode 12 of Transplaner RPG airs this coming Saturday, December 4th at 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time. If you don't know what that is, if you're tuning into this, if you're watching the VOD, you're like, what the hell is that? Transplaner RPG is the all-trans POC-led, 100% homebrewed, D&D 5th edition live-streamed actual play campaign set in an original non-colonial anti-orientalist world that IGM. Uh, yeah, it's an actual play. You should tune in. Twitch Saturdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time, though we are switching things up in 2022, but stay tuned for announcements. Follow us on Twitter, um, Patreon, uh, Twitch, I think Instagram and Tumblr at Transplaner RPG. Uh, with the Transplaner plug out of the way, let's get right into the lecture. Hello, everyone. Thanks for dropping by. I'm Connie, Connie Chong. You can find me on Twitter, Patreon, and itch at by Connie Chong. That's B Y C O N N I E C H A N G. My pronouns are they, he, and she, so you really can't go wrong with me. Um, I am a professional actual play performer and game master. Uh, I have GM'd for our Magpie Games Curated Play program as a professional GM. I have appeared on various streams and podcasts either, either as a player or as a GM. And I've got a lot of exciting things cooking on the back burner for 2022. So thank you for tuning in. Um, and Professor Chong's Tabletop Workshop is my GM tip and advice lecture series. And this is, of course, episode 13. And what befits that unlucky number more than a lecture about death? Specifically, the death of player characters. Character death. Uh, so an overview of what you can expect today from today's lecture is we're going to start with an introduction. What is character death? Why is it important? Why are we talking about it now? What's the context of this lecture? And then I'm going to go on to discuss... The function of death in a TTRPG campaign or a DD and d campaign, uh, other approaches to looking at and thinking about and playing with character death that, that I think are pretty non-normative, uh, and other stakes and rewards to include and manufacture and create in your campaign to cultivate engagement outside of PC death. Right. And of course, ending it as always with audience questions. Those who are tuning in right now are my patrons who are pledged at the apprentice level or higher. That's eight bucks a month. So thank you so much for tuning in. All apprentices and above get to tune in live to Professor Chong's and ask questions, potentially shaping the things I address at the end of my lectures. And of course, very much help with continuing to keep PC um, TW alive Uh and, and manageable for me. So thank you to all of my patrons. I love you all so much. Uh, and then, of course, a sign off after that. Uh, and that's it. So with that out of the way, let's get right into the lecture for today with a quick introduction. Character death. As of the recording of this, though I feel like this is a conversation that will persist beyond, uh, PC death in TTRPGs, specifically I think like D&D, 5e, and like Pathfinder 2e is a pretty hot topic right now. I've been seeing a lot of discourse about it on Twitter, um, on TikTok, on Tumblr, on my various social media platforms. And I'm seeing essentially two major camps when we talk about PC death. Camp A is pro PC death as a stake, right? Uh, they believe that D&D &D specifically should have stakes and that death is one of them, right? It's a war game. You're supposed to be tactical about it. Death is always a risk, right? And is part of, for Camp A, what makes the game fun. The possibility that your character could die is what keeps the game thrilling and dynamic and engaging and interesting, right? And then there's Camp B, which for lack of a better term, uh, I guess is anti-PC death, right? Uh, these are folks who think that there are other kinds of stakes, right? For them, it's less of a war game at the forefront. It's more of a storytelling, collaborative storytelling game where story and character come first, right? So the risk of dying for these folks isn't necessarily what compels them to play as opposed to perhaps folks in Camp A. And I think this is a very generalized and simplistic way of looking at the discourse, but boiling it down to two big camps I think I can make that generalization pretty confidently. And my perspective here is that there's no right or wrong answer, right? Just to start things off, it's whatever works for your table, right? But my perspective specifically is there's nuance in this conversation that I feel like is 
I'm missing a little in this discourse. Um, I think a lot of the approaches to how death should be handled in your game depends on why your table is playing together in the first place and what you're collectively hoping to get out of the experience, right? So I guess you could put me in camp C for Connie. Uh, I like a little bit of both. I do like death. Uh, I think death of PCs can be a cool and interesting stake if done well, but I also think that there are other stakes we should develop and consider for a more well-rounded play experience. And I think that we as a community need to be more reflexive um, and I think uh, self-aware uh, and a little bit more intentional about why, why the ability for player characters to die should even be be like part of the game in the first place right i don't like that it's the default i think it should be an intentional and informed choice by all parties at the table right um so let's get into it uh starting with i think the function of death right why what is the point of having pcs be able to die right i think the short answer for me is that player death not player death uh player character death <laughs> my god player character death is a narrative stake Right. Uh, and what is a narrative stake? Uh, I define it as a way to keep your players invested in the campaign and the outcome of the story. Right. So this idea of death as a stake is death as a way to get your players to care about the plot and their characters. Right. Um, so the, the the thought that your character could die keeps you wanting to play. Right. Or like it's it's a possible risk that keeps the game fun and exciting. Right. And like, ooh, I could die here, so I better play my cards right. Right. So I'll get into that line of thinking a little bit later. Uh, but for some tables, I would say that death is an informed risk that PCs undertake when they go adventuring, right? Um, and I think this mindset is quite common uh, at tables with a more traditional approach to playing D&D, where PCs aren't necessarily the quote-unquote main characters of the world or even the campaign, um, where some degree of plot armor could be expected for them, I think, at more quote-unquote modern tables, right? Um, and I think that's fine. Right, that's not necessarily my cup of tea. I don't necessarily like that approach, um, both either to GM or to play. Uh, but it, it could be your cup of tea, right? I'm not here to yuck other people's yum. Uh, but I think my issue with these kinds of tables really comes to the forefront when there is an often unspoken assumption on the behalf of the GM, which is this mindset of, oh, death is a risk, but it's avoidable as long as my players play the way I want them to play. Right. Uh, whether that's smart role playing, which um, I've seen, uh, you know, Reddit, TTRBG, D&D horror stories where players be like, oh, I like saw this one post that my partner referenced about like how this like new player was like, I was captured by these bandits and like the bandit leader like interrogated me and I spat at the bandit leader's feet. Right. Because that was interesting RP on my behalf. And the bandit leader just kept attacking me while restrained. So every attack was essentially like had advantage on it. And there was like it was out of initiative. So he could just keep swinging on me until I died. Right. Um, and the GM was like, well, that's what the bandit leader would do because he's really arrogant. Um, and if you spit at him, of course, he's going to try to kill you. And that's how that player's first ever D&D &D table. That's how their PC died. And I can say, like. And a lot of GMs were defending that decision, you know, even though the player was like, hey, this kind of turned me off of playing. Like, if this is what D&D is like, I don't know if I like it. And I think that's my problem with that mindset, uh, which is the idea that the GM's like, oh, well, you didn't role play the way that you were supposed to role play. So the consequence is me wailing on your character until I fucking die. That's like one example, right, of I think kind of substandard GMing, honestly. Another example is like, oh, if your player doesn't make the most optimal or the smart, the smartest combat choice, right? Oh, you're a fighter. Why aren't you spending every like tur like every action you take to just like wail on this thing? If your fighter's like, I actually want to run over to the other side of the dungeon and pull this lever, you know, that I see the kobolds pulling. I want to see what it does, right? And like you as a GM are like, oh, well, because you left the fight, I guess your backline's exposed, so your wizard's dead now right like i've seen that you know i've heard of stuff like that happening uh and you know like another example is like when your players don't engage with puzzles in the way you want them to like if you're very much playing the, like guess what i'm thinking game with like puzzles in a dungeon where like there's only one answer and your players are trying creative things right like they're like how do we get past this door how do we get past this riddle they're trying a bunch of creative and interesting things but you're like nope no that doesn't work 
Uh, no, that doesn't work. Actually, the room starts filling with water. Okay, uh, y'all drown now and you're all dead. Bye. Right? Like, because they didn't figure out that it was like uh, like an alphanumerical puzzle that they needed to solve or something like that. Right? Um, or like whatever smart engagement with the plot or smart or correct engagement with your campaign that you've written for them. I think that's a really bad way to approach GMing, actually. Just kind of full stop. Like, no matter what kind of game you're trying to run. Um, and... It all boils down to this idea that players who deviate from your golden path are punished, right? Often with death. Uh, and player character death should never be a punishment, I think. Um, I think some particularly adversarial or power-hungry GMs do use PC death as a punishment, and they cloak it in this like language of, oh, it's just consequences for your actions. That's the exact same thing that problematic players say when they say, oh, it's just what my character would do, right? Like when they like do something kind of shitty or toxic, right? And I think we, we as a community can do better than that, right? Um, and usually the punishment comes in the form of like, oh, you're deviating from my story. You're deviating from like the correct way to engage with these NPCs or the correct way to engage with this puzzle or the correct way to engage with this like mystery or whatever, right? And I think it's a sign of like massively underdeveloped GMing, honestly. And like, let go of your ego for a second there, buddy, right? Um, there's a difference between furnishing consequences for the player's in action or action and going out of your way to make them feel bad for doing something you didn't expect or want them to do. And I think that's often a fine line and it takes experience to know what's happening and how to like engage with both situations. Um, but I do think it's important to make that distinction, right? Uh, and I think another reason why PC death as the norm, as just like an like a part of adventuring, isn't my cup of tea, is that death as a stake becomes something to avoid, right? It's something to fear and dislike when it happens inevitably, right? Uh, so even at tables with informed consent, right, where everyone agrees to death as a possible outcome for bad roles or faulty role playing or whatever, it can be upsetting to have your character die. Uh, especially if the death is kind of random, <laughs> like a bunch of gnolls attack and you just like had a bunch of bad rolls and they crit or something and you die, right? Or because of factors out of your control, like bad rolls or the GM critting or someone else's choices, right? Like the fighter just deciding to leave the combat and leaving your backline exposed, right? And you as a wizard can't really do anything about that, right? Necessarily. Um, I saw a Twitter post about this recently where a GM, I'm not going to name names. I never name names. Um, was talking about how they felt bad because they killed off one of their uh, player's characters uh, in a way that, you know, they were like, maybe it was kind of cruel because what had happened was the player was knocked, the character was knocked down to zero and the monsters they were up against were evil, very evil and nasty and very intelligent, right? And the, the, the monster they were fighting decided to keep going after the player that was down because that's what it would do, like, intelligently. And it used inflict wounds and because they were incapacitated, it was a crit and they rolled really high on all the damage dice and killed the, the character outright, right? And like in the replies, like everyone was like, oh, well, maybe to, like a way to move past this in the future is to have a session zero where you talk about death. But the, the OP was like, we did. We did have a session zero and everyone signed up for death, but the player was still really upset and their feelings were still massively hurt. And like through the replies, like a little bit of context came out. Like this player had been playing this character for two years and like they were fine with their character dying, right? But it still hurt them deeply and it felt a little like based on like the replies a little unsatisfying I think both for the GM and for the player character like the the, the player wasn't mad at the GM I think they were just upset and rightfully so because they'd spent a lot of time and energy and effort and love and care pouring into playing this character just to have them die honestly because of factors out of their control right they were down there's nothing they can do to avoid inflict wounds right and like it's not like the rest of their party were like going out of their way to try to save them right so they just died um and it's an interesting situation where the player at that table during session zero had agreed to that kind of play and that kind of table and that kind of consequence but feelings were still hurt they were still upset Right, Because even at these tables, death is a loss state. It is a state of defeat. You have failed in some way, shape, or form. Straight up. Um, and at these tables, like no one jumps up and claps and cheers when their PC dies, right? Like no one's like, "Ah, oh, fuck, uh, but that was awesome, right? It's usually like, what? Oh, 
and then like they have to process it for maybe like a week or two after right and like they're still upset about it even when the game's over right um it's still a painful experience i think like an emotionally negative experience that involves upset feelings above the game um so that's why i think this approach of oh all pcs should be able to die it's a game with risk doesn't really resonate with me. It's not really my cup of tea. Because my immediate thought, like when I read that post is, well, why wasn't the death fun? <laughs> you know? Like, what could I have done differently to make that death fun and feel exciting and interesting and like cool to play out as opposed to this really painful experience right um and like what other narrative stakes and risks can we as gms build into our campaigns that are fun for the players to encounter and gamble with instead of scary or upsetting so i'm gonna take a pause right there to just sip some water keep an eye on the chat hi it's just yuchi actors hello welcome <laughs> Glad you're here. Thanks for keeping me company. Um, if you have any questions, of course, always drop them in uh, chat and I will answer them at the end. So let's talk about other approaches to PC death, right? So don't get me wrong. Like I've mentioned earlier, I like PC death. I like death as a stake. I do. I'm not saying that I don't want my PCs to be able to die full stop because that isn't, that isn't the kind of game or the kind of campaign I'm interested in running. I like it when PCs are, are have, have the possibility of dying. Um, but I'm very specific about how I like it, right? I love me a dramatic, heroic, self-sacrifice moment. You know what I mean? Or like a big, dramatic, emotional death at the hands of the big bad in like the final confrontation. A death that matters, right? And a death that is a choice. And my players love that too, right? Like, give that shit to us. Give that shit to me. We love talking about it, right? Uh, and for me, for PC death to not just feel not upsetting or not scary, but actively fun and exciting and interesting and most of all rewarding, there needs to be open communication, right? Between the GM and the players and the players to the GM. Talk to your players, right? In what scenario would you be okay with your PC dying, if at all? There's no wrong answer, right? F as an example, for my players at Transplaner at our table, um, during session zero, we said we're okay with our PCs dying if uh, it's pre-mediated, basically, for lack of a better term. If, like, they know it's coming, right? And they know how they're going to die, uh, by whose hands, and if they have narrative control over the moment of their death. Right. Uh, so I will allow them, I'll give them the agency, I will encourage them to describe how they die, what their character looks like in their dying moments, what their final words are, like a final action they take to maybe like change, you know, the story in some way. Right. Um, I give them all the agency possible to make their death as memorable and badass and gut wrenching as they want it to be. Um, and outside of the situation, for my table, at least with Transplaner, death isn't really the stake here. Right. I mean, if you've been watching Transplater, you know that death. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but uh, something about destiny and death and players being destined to die and all that. Uh, that is part of the story, uh, the story that we all signed up to tell. Um, but outside of that, I think I don't think it's a spoiler to say that like Oka can just die from like a random bandit attack because that would be so unsatisfying right like not just for uh the player who plays oka but also for the audience and also for me as a gm if i like for some freak reason rolled like three nat 20s in a roll and oka was already at like 30 percent health and i just took them like oh, way over like zero and they would technically just insta die that's just kind of not fun you know, that's just not a fun way to go. That's not a way to go that I would wish upon anyone, really. Um, you know, they, you know, my players, my players' characters can go to zero. They can get knocked unconscious. They can even roll death saving throws and fail all of them. But I won't kill them off, right? Uh, and as an example for the death saving throw, in arc one, like episode 13 or 14 or something, um, one of my PCs, Manaya, who's this half-orc fighter, just a fighter at the time, went to zero and started rolling death saves and f and got, I think got like a nat one, uh, which is like an automatic two failures or something. And then like failed the third one or something like that. So she, she straight up died. Manaya in that moment straight up died. Right. And I could see like the look on my player's face. Like Lyra was like, 
was really sad. Like, I could see in her face that she was, like, coming to terms with it. She was like, okay, like, I can be okay with this, but it's going to take me some time to process. But I was like, I'm not done with Manaya yet. Like, we've built your character up for 14 episodes. There are seeds I've planted. There are hooks I want to see through to the end. It's unsatisfying for me as a GM to kill off your character in this moment. So I'm not going to do it. So what I did was I had Manaya stabilize despite the three failed death saves and have like a voice come into her head, right? A voice of her long lost mother's warlock patron saying, no, this can't happen. Manaya, just say yes. And Manaya said yes. And she took a level in warlock and came back up to one, right? So like that, there's, you're fucking God, okay? GMs, you're fucking God. You can do this. You can, you can save your PCs from death. You can, you really can. Um, it's not like, oh, they died. Well, too bad. My hands are tied. I guess you're just going to have to live with it, loser. Like, that's... You don't have to do that to your players, especially if it's a character they care about. Like, I just, like... I, my heart breaks for the player in that Twitter thread. They played that character for two years. Two freaking years, and they died because they went to zero, and this thing got, like, a crit and rolled really high on Inflict Wounds? That sucks rocks, my dude. That sucks rocks. And I'm not blaming the GM here, right? The GM was obviously also really torn up about it, right? And that was the kind of game they'd sign up to play, but man, there are alternative stakes you could throw at your players. Honestly, if you just go to death as a default, I think, and like don't even consider the possibility of other stakes or other outcomes, I think that's just uncreative GMing, my dude. Um, <laughs> full stop. So... You know, even though that kind of random death, I would say, isn't a stake at Transplaner's table, we still have a ton of fun, and things are still interesting and dynamic and exciting, and the story keeps my players guessing, and it keeps the audience guessing too, right? Our story's still fucking baller, baby! Uh, for, you know, not to toot my own horn too much, but toot toot, motherfucker. Uh, and how's that possible, right? Like, how can we still have a campaign that I think is pretty, pretty dang awesome without, like, random encounter death or like minions being able to kill my character or like my PC is like a possibility, right? How's that possible, right? Well, that's because there are other stakes, right? Not just other bad outcomes that my players want to avoid, though that is true, right? And what I mean by that is getting kidnapped instead of getting killed off, right? Getting captured, uh, having a part of your soul ripped out of your body. I have done that before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, losing your loot, uh, getting stranded, getting the party separated, um, having an NPC get ki kidnapped or captured or killed off because, you know, of bad roles or whatever. There's so many other bad outcomes you can throw at your players that aren't death. And that's like a whole other lecture that I could just like come up with like a, a D100 table of other bad outcomes, right? Um, but that's not what this lecture is about. What I mean in terms of keeping my players invested are other stakes, right? In the sense of reasons why my players continue to care about the campaign and want to keep playing. And that gets me into the next and the final part of this lecture, which is discussing other kinds of stakes and rewards, right? Uh, which are a little different from just character death as a concept. Um, positive stakes, or I think more accurately, I guess these wouldn't even be stakes because it's not something you would lose. They're hooks, the reasons you want to keep playing right? Hooks are things in the campaign that players actively seek out and want to engage with, right? So an example of a hook is a good mystery, right? What happened here? What's currently happening? What's going to happen next, right? Keep your players guessing. And honestly, sidebar, I would argue that any story-driven campaign that's not just like a straight dungeon crawl is a mystery, not just mystery campaigns, because you're always so much of a, so much of like a campaign running a story-based campaign is you as a GM sitting on information and deciding what information to share with your PCs in what way and why and when and how often. But that is a different lecture for another day, right? The idea of every campaign is a mystery. Um, another example of a hook are interesting NPCs, right? What does this person look like? What do they want? What aren't they telling me? Why are they doing this? You know, what's their personality like? What do they care about? All of these questions go into creating and portraying an interesting NPC. And of course, another hook would be a vibrant world, right? What does this place look like? What is weird or strange or beautiful or dangerous or all of these things about this place, right? Why are those rocks shaped like that? Who rules this place? Who founded this town? What's underneath this place? What's above this place, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In short, it's kind of a cop-out answer. In short, 
have a compelling campaign, have a compelling world, have a compelling plot outside of the risk of death, right? Um, and I actually want to take this moment right now to turn that question on its head. Instead of me, I feel like Camp B people are always put in the position of having to defend not being able to kill off my PCs. I want to ask those in Camp A, why is PC death an inevitable stake at your table? And I ask this in good faith. Why? I just want, you know, I want us to all be reflexive about the choices we make um, and the norms we establish at our tables, right? Is it because you feel like, you know, the kind of story you're telling is kind of gritty and death is a possibility and you want the world to feel dangerous in that way? Um, and you want, you know, your players to be really mindful about how they approach combat um, and, you know, your PCs are maybe not like the main characters or the chosen ones of the campaign and there's a possibility of rolling up a different character and playing a different character you know, is that why? Because I think, you know, I think that's a valid and valuable answer. Or is it because uh, you're scared that your players won't invest in the campaign or take it seriously or do shitty things if they know they can't die, right? And if that's the case, then why, my answer, my question, follow-up question to you is why are you playing with those people? Um, if the only reason your players quote unquote behave is because of the threat of potential punishment through literally getting their characters offed, that's not a table I want to play at. Um, and that is a larger conversation, I think, that you need to be having with your players about respect. Um, and yeah, I think like ultimately, I would like to shift the conversation around PC death as a whole. I don't think it should be treated as the default method of play in D&D or Pathfinder or whatever TTRPG you're playing, right? And I don't like that it is. I straight up don't. I think it should be an informed, active, and enthusiastic choice from all parties at the table with specific boundaries about specific kinds of death and what kinds of death are and aren't okay. Right. Like maybe you're, you're, you know, like at Transplaner's table, we're OK with our PCs dying if we all know about it beforehand. If it's like a major plot point. Right. Like it's not random. And if like my players have like total narrative control over the moment of their character's death. Right. Or maybe your players are like, fuck, yeah, throw all the slime monsters at me. This is a dungeon crawl adventure. Death is exciting to me and I want to be able to die here. Right. I wanted this to be super tactical. That's great, too. Right. But I just think we should be more intentional about why we're allowing death to happen at our tables um, and what kind of play experience we're trying to curate by having that be a possibility. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm going to take a pause here. Look to see if we have any questions. Hi, Nicole. Uh, seems like uh, I'm just going to read out the chat. <laughs> Feels like some of these DMs forget that this should be a collaborative storytelling game and creative and creative gameplay. Yes. Um, it's interesting, though, Chiakres, because some GMs really don't see D&D as a collaborative storytelling game, right? They see it as like a war game, which in a lot of ways it is, right? That was a lot of the foundation, I think, for a lot of the mechanics um, uh, and a lot of the text. Uh, but... As D&D reaches wider and wider audiences, as more people start playing D&D and other TTRPGs, especially like queer and trans and people of color, um, start getting gaining more visibility in the conversation and in our communities, I think we should be very active and very open and very excited um, about engaging with different modes of playing and different modes of, of viewing death, right? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about like the play experiences where I've had the least amount of fun, I think has been games where it's been made clear either through the session zero, like the GM has directly stated it, or through how things have played out uh, in the campaign that where my character doesn't feel important. Um, and I think a lot of like tables where player death is a possibility um, are tables where the PCs aren't important. Um, and what I mean by important is maybe it's a little railroady or like, uh, there's a specific story the GM wants to tell and they're going to tell it, goddammit, no matter what their players, characters do or how their players feel about it. Right. Um, there is like a mystery. Like I have prepped, you know, for example, for Transplaner, um, each arc has its own kind of self-contained mystery. Right. And I do prep 
things for it. I prep NPCs and motivations, and I prep like out possible outcomes um, and set piece encounters and monsters and villains, right? Um, but I also prep like things that engage my players on a one to one level, right? I'll you know. Even though the too long arc currently is kind of like Oka's backstory arc, um, I still gave Manaya stuff to engage with, right? I still gave Dewey stuff to engage with. V's doing tons of stuff that she's engaging with, right? Um, and that's also really important to me as a GM that at any given point in a campaign, like all of my PCs and my players feel like they have something to do that's relevant to what they're interested in and not just what I want them to be interested in as a GM. Um, and I think that kind of GMing is also more common at tables where death is not taken lightly or like it's not like a very common consequence or a common bad outcome uh, of a role, right? Uh, and yeah, I think that's like it in terms of the lecture today. Uh, my overall thoughts are that I just want it to be more reflexive about why we're allowing death to happen at the table um, and, you know, to just empower GMs and players to say no to death. Straight up, if you don't want your PC to die, I think that should be a possibility and you should tell your GM, right? Uh, and if you're the kind of GM where, you know, uh, you feel like it would be, you feel like it, you would feel like a bad guy if uh, your players have sunk like months or even years into playing this one specific PC and then they die kind of in like a random way, it can be dramatic. The death can be dramatic, right? You can describe it really interestingly. But like it could happen in a way that makes your player go, oh, uh, that wasn't how I expected my player, my PC's story to end. But I guess that's OK. Right. Like it's also just not satisfying as a GM. If you've set up these things for your PC's backstory that because they die, they never get to tie up. That's just not satisfying all around. Why dig this grave for yourself? You don't have to. You're fucking God. Right? You don't have to. Um, I know, like, a common response is, oh, resurrection magic. Oh, now the other party members can go on a quest to, like, revive the soul. And that's fun. I think that's a fun way of dealing with death, right? Um, but that can also, you know, that can take, you know, turn it kind of into a side quest, right? Or, like, shunt the campaign off into a different direction, right? And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there are ways to do it that can be fun and engaging and very rewarding. But that is just something you have to consider. Right, because you will basically be starting another quest um, for your for the rest of your party to deal with, essentially. Um, yeah, I think those are my thoughts um, about it. Uh, again, like there's no right or wrong way to play a tabletop role playing game. We're all a bunch of nerds sitting around a table, um, vividly visualizing things that aren't happening, uh, and I think that there are ways to do that that are more compassionate and more creative um, and more open hearted than other ways. Uh, and it's all about figuring out what works for your table. Uh, so Chiacres, if you have any questions, ooh, I'm seeing some questions now, yay, let's answer them. So Chiacres asks, why is PC death inevitable in Transplaner? You've made it clear that they can change some aspect of this destiny, but the ending is unchanging. Um, I don't want to spoil things too much, but okay, spoilers for Transplaner coming up ahead. Uh, so if you're on the podcast, or if you haven't gotten up to this point, I would say spoilers for Hounds of Mercy episode four, the Duchess episode, whenever they go to the court, and uh, a Transplaner Mate campaign arc four, episode eight, spoilers. So if you haven't seen either of those episodes or beyond, plug your ears, don't listen to this next, this next part. Okay, I'm going to talk about it now. So this idea that PC death is inevitable in Transplaner is speaking to, of course, the Paragon prophecy, which is this, this idea that the Paragons are destined to die in order to save Endake. And that's the piece of lore that I've dropped to my players that they've learned, right? Oh, that's what the nightmares mean. Oh, like the eight of us are supposed to die right now, right? And our god shards as well are supposed to die so that the stranger can be defeated and Endake can be restored to its original state, right? Um, that's the information that my PCs are working with. And I've made it very clear to my players above the table, like outside of the game, out of character, that I'm open to them trying to fight back against Destiny. I am. As a GM, I'm interested, you know, like if they're like, you know what, I really want to research ways that we can save ourselves and Andake or like I'm interested in learning like more about the stranger so we can figure out like how to beat the stranger without having to die. I'm open to that. 
you know, I'm super open to like a like arc eight, which is will be our final arc, like grand finale, like big bad showdown against a stranger where they use the power of friendship to save themselves. And the, like, I'm open to that. You know what I mean? I'm super open. It's just within the lore itself. That's what the prophecy is. Um, and the characters might think it's inevitable, but the players know that I'm super flexible. Right. Um, and I'm open to having a conversation about it. So that's how I'm addressing this idea of like PC death being quote unquote inevitable. It is qu in, in heavy quotations inevitable, I think in Transplaner. But if my character, if my players care about trying to avert that destiny enough um, and like put time and energy and effort into like a side quest to, to avoid it, then I will reward them for that effort, right? I want that effort to pay off in some way, shape or form without spoiling things too much. Um... Sleepy Origami says, it feels like D&D is split based on its history as a number crunching war game like Risk and its present as a more narrative game where characters are more than tokens. I would agree. Um, I think I'm just friends and colleagues with like a lot of folks in the community where the latter is kind of like the the default mode of play where like emotional and engaged role playing and like story and character are at the forefront of it, as opposed to like, I move my character like 15 feet and I like use, you know, so I can get into this like blast radius or whatever. And it's, I think there is kind of, to an extent, a false dichotomy uh, between the idea of D&D as a war game and the idea of like D&D as like a story game, right? I don't think you have to have one or the other. I think there's a way to do really crunchy mechanical combat uh, in a campaign where role playing and story and character are also really important. I think there's a way that it can be done. Um, I'm not sure if D&D is the best system to do it in though, necessarily. And I can't think of a system that does it currently uh but if you have suggestions i'm all ears um i think that honestly for me would be like the next evolution of ttrpgs for me um i would be interested in designing games that are tactical and crunchy but also in the mechanics reward role playing and like put character stories and journeys at the forefront of the campaign um yeah uh, Chiaknes goes on to say, not sure if this is too off base, but what about death in terms of your characters killing off others? Does that also add to the stakes if it's not just a blast everyone in your way campaign? Absolutely. Um, I know that the title of this lecture is character death, but I've spent like all of it talking about PC death instead of NPC death, which is the other, which is the other side of that dynamic, right? Um, NPCs are fair game for me. Um, to an extent that's a little bit more open and flexible than PCs being fair game, um, because NPCs aren't just characters, they are tools for me in a way that PCs aren't. Because my players control their PCs completely. That's really important for me as a GM. Like, I... I want to honor their agency and I always want to give players the ability to say what their character is doing or saying or looking like at a given moment. I don't want to prescribe that to them, right? And it's important for me not to do that. Uh, but NPCs, I control them and I can use them to basically be like mouthpieces for certain pieces of lore that I want my players to know or like certain, excuse me, certain themes I want to make clear in the campaign, right? So I will be a lot... I think crueler with killing off my darlings uh, when it comes to NPCs to drive a point home. But I think it depends on how important the NPC is. If it's an NPC that's kind of a side character, like the PCs aren't necessarily super interested in them, but they've come up a few times and then like I kill them off in a really dramatic way. I think that's fine and it should happen. And it's a good tool that you can put in your GM toolbox, right? Um, on the other side, if it's like a really major NPC or more likely it's an NPC that the, PC has that the PCs have adopted and really like, you know, that you weren't expecting to be a major NPC, uh, I'm a little bit more careful with killing them off because sometimes if I just kill them off, the PCs will be like, well, we could have prevented that. You never gave us a choice to stop that from happening, right? So I think the question you always wanna ask yourself as a GM, uh, before killing off your own NPCs or allowing NPCs to be killed off by players is do I want their death to be evitable, <laughs> right? Like, can their death actually be avoided, right? And if the answer is yes, then I would say, like, flag to your players or signal to your players that, like, danger is looming around this NPC and give your party a chance to intervene before you straight up kill them off, right? Um I think that would be my piece of advice. If you're like, okay, in order for the story to move forward, this major NPC has to die, just kill them off. 
just kill them off. Like, don't give your players the chance to try to intervene because if they roll a nat 20 and you still have to figure out a way to, like, undermine their nat 20, they're going to feel cheated. Um, so sometimes you just have to make a hard move as a GM. Uh, and if your players get mad at that, uh, maybe communicate to your players that, you know, it was necessary for me to kill off this NPC for the plot to move forward, right? Um, just communicate that. And I've done similar kinds of communication in similar situations with the transplaner crew before where I'm like, hey, XYZ is gonna happen. Uh, you're not gonna be able to stop it from happening. I just want you to know above the game so you don't feel cheated when we're actually in the game. And like, I found that in my experience, as long as I communicate that uh, in advance, my players are cool with it happening, right? But like when the, the story actually happens, they like play out their PC, like acting super surprised or shocked or upset, but like they as a player are fine, right? Um, uh, Chiakres goes on, I also want to say that this is in the context of an actual play. Um, it might, the conversation might look different if it's just a home game, uh, because there isn't an audience to act toward or play toward, right? Like, oh, this person's going to get away. So, okay. Okay. So a little peek behind the scenes. Um, this is also spoilers for arc four. So if you're not deep into arc four of Transplaner, don't listen. Uh, slash if you don't care about spoilers, it's fine. Um, there's a moment where the Paragon killer attacks Oka. Right, and is about to straight up murk Oka, but the Hounds of Mercy arrive and basically save Oka. And the Paragon Killer runs away, right, and gets away. The Paragon Killer gets away. The Hounds of Mercy don't stop them. They're unable to prevent them from leaving. And I know that at that cliffhanger, I had a conversation with the players behind the Hounds of Mercy being like, hey, it's it would really fuck things up for me plot-wise if the Hounds of Mercy captured the Paragon Killer right now. I need them to get away. And my, you know, my Hounds of Mercy players were like, okay uh great we're cool with that and like we worked out a way for that to happen in the fiction where i had the npc traveling with the hounds run after the paragon killer and like she wasn't able to stop them from getting away right uh, that's how we sort of dealt with it in the campaign um and i want to say that like those moments might i think like in retrospect perhaps for an audience member feel manufactured but they're really not um it's it's still fun for us to play out and i think it's fun for the audience to encounter as well um and just like having a game where you know there's a strong and legible story is more important to us than a game where anything and everything could happen. And it's just about like what's important to your table, right? And I know that like the peak behind the screen might be kind of uncomfortable for some audience members being like, it might feel like, oh, what? You know, like how much of the story is like improvised then? I would say like a lot of the story is still improvised. And like that conversation is the exception. Usually I, I don't really have those conversations with my players and it's like what they do can actually change the plot in a major way. Um, but that was like one like like peg, I think, on the railroad that I was like, this would really, truly fuck up like what I have planned for the rest of Arc 4 if like this happened, right? So I, you know, told my players that and they were very um, flexible with me and willing to acquiesce. Uh, so moving on, Chiakre says, so would you say that for a PC to kill an NPC should also be something treated as a tool to serve a purpose? I would say... I would say there should be a reason why PCs kill NPCs, um, and it should be a reason that um, synergizes with the kind of world you're playing in and the kind of story you're telling. In Transplaner, none of the PCs are evil, right? Uh, we don't have a murder hobo campaign, and in the world of Endake, pre-cataclysm especially, murder is super unusual. People don't just go around killing bandits in Endake. And that has part, you know, part, a lot of the reason behind that world design is for me envisioning a non-colonial anti-orientalist realm or setting, right? And for me, a realm that is non-colonial and anti-orientalist is a realm without cops and without just random people murdering each other, right? Even in the name of quote-unquote good. Right? Like, that just doesn't happen, right? Bandits or people who hurt other people are captured, could be knocked unconscious, could be beat up, right? But they're usually brought to justice in some way, shape, or form, community accountability, or they're exiled, or like some other form, I think, of um, uh, restorative justice, I guess, uh, that makes contextual sense for that particular community, right? And for the particular hurt that they've committed and the, the, pe the specific kinds of people they've hurted. <laughs> they've hurt it. The specific kinds of people they hurt. Damn, that shit hurt it. Um, so, my response to you is if in a transplaner campaign or in a transplaner game, a PC randomly tried to kill an NPC, I would X-card that as a GM. Full stop. 
because safety tools are not just for players to use, they're also for the GM. I'd be like, um, no, I'm actually not okay with your PC just straight up murdering this NPC right now without trying anything else, right? Like, that is not cool with me. I would not allow that. Um, and I think I honestly probably also wouldn't allow that in a home game um, because that's not the kind of play culture I want to cultivate at my table. It is not. Uh, I am not a fan of murder hoboism and I'm not a fan of PCs who are just like, I'm done with trying to interrogate this person. I chop their head off. Like, I think that's, I think there are some situations where that can work. Uh, I'm thinking of like a situation where in a home game I ran, there was this really shitty guy, a really shitty NPC from one of my PC's backstories who came up, um, was kind of related to one of my PC's backstories, and uh, another PC executed him, like chopped his head off, right? But that was after the party had interrogated him and like squeezed him of all the information he had, and he was clearly unrepentant, right? Uh, and that was when that player was like, I step up and I chop his head off because like his hands were bound. There was no way he could have resisted. And I was like, oh, and the rest of the party was like, what? But they were cool with it, right? So I think there are situations where it could work, right? Um, but it's contextual. And if it just comes out of the blue or is like the first resort instead of the last resort or is done because the player is bored or like uninterested in the story or they just want to cause chaos or, fu or fuck things up for other people, then I will X card it and I will not allow it to happen. Um, full stop. But I do have a little bit more flexibility. I also just generally don't like campaigns where you go around just killing bandits um, because I feel like murder is a really serious thing. I don't know. Um, and it's, I think, you know, there's a time and place. Like if you're in a Witcher campaign or a really grim, dark, really gritty campaign where like murder is pretty common and people just go around killing each other, I guess it's fine. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind, the kind of play culture you're cultivating at, at your table and the kinds of themes you're grappling with and the tone of your campaign in general, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so moving on, I remember uh, Chiakides goes on to say, I remember you've previously talked about encounters serving a purpose and not just random fights. Yes. Uh, I think a lot of that is on the GM. Uh, if you're constantly throwing random encounters at your players, you know, I mean, if, if that's the kind of campaign you're running, that's the camp kind of campaign you're running and it can be fun, uh, but that's not the kind of campaign I run or the kind of story I'm interested in telling, right? Um, all encounters for me are important, even if it seems like a random encounter on the surface, like there's usually like a deeper lore purpose for it, right? Um, I would say, or like a deeper plot reason for the encounter to happen. I think the closest thing in Transplaner to a random encounter that I've thrown at my players have mostly been restricted to arcs one and the arc one interlude. And since then, it's been over a year since arc one. I think I've grown a lot as a GM and I don't think I've I've ran a single random encounter since then. Like all combat encounters have been built up to, have been very obvious. For example, in arc four, the most recent random encounter, not random encounter, the most recent combat encounter we had was Oka versus the Paragon Killer, right? And it might've seemed random because Oka was attacked out of nowhere, but the person attacking them was the Paragon Killer or the Assassin, which has been built up to since like episode three or four, right? And that was episode eight. So like three to four session sessions that passed since then. And it made sense. It was legible in the story, right? The dramaturgy was there, right? It wasn't like just, it was just like a random bandit shooting Oka out of the sky, right? Um, Sleepy Origami says, can slash should RPG safety tools be used to rewind or undo a character death, major item loss, etc. in the moment? Yeah. I yeah, I think yes, absolutely yes. My my response is an enthusiastic yes. Um, um that's what they're there for. If something happens that you as a PC are like I've Jesus, like, you know, like you lost a really important item, or like you died, or like you're you know, your companion died and you are really not okay with it. I think you can X, I think you can X card it, right? And like your party as a group can figure out a different way forward. This isn't like a, you know, you know, a video game with no save files, right? Just think of it as reloading like a quick save slot, right? Like it's, it's possible, especially if rewinding or undoing something um, will save you a lot of grief down the line. Right. And I think there are situations where you're like, oh, like maybe instead of X carding it, you feel like orange or yellow about it. You're like, 
I, you really didn't want it to happen, but you could be okay with it. Um, that's really dependent on you. And I think after the session ends, it's important for the GM to check in with the player um, and to be attentive to their player's like emotional state. Like check in like, oh, hey, I noticed that when I did that to your character or when this happened, like you got kind of like a look on your face. I just wanted to see if you were okay and just talk it out with your player. I have offered to my players before to unwind something that's happened even in a streamed game. Um, and they've said no. Because they're like, you know what? It's actually fine. I can work with this. Um, I think it's just really dependent on your player um, and on the table. Um, but I think you can, um, maybe should. I don't know if should is the right word, but I think you can definitely use those tools in that way. Um, and the should depends on the player's comfort level. Uh, and I think on the GM's ability to find a creative way forward in their story that still fits what they have planned for the campaign uh, without doing the major item loss or killing off the character, right? Uh, yes. Oh, excuse me, bumped it. Looks like those are all the questions that we have for tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Chiakres and Sleepy Origami, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Chiakres goes on to say, in case a more inexperienced GM lets the death happen, panics and lacks that moment of creativity, but it's not set in stone. Exactly. Yeah, this can be like an incredible tool for a GM who's kind of uh, newer at their craft, right? They're like, oh, shit. Oh, I did roll a crit. Uh, I guess you do die, you know? Um, and they feel bad about the decision. Like this, you know, this also empowers that newer GM um to you know try something else you know there's an improv game called um oh my god so many different names of uh, it's called buzzer or um something else or i forget that ah, it's been so long since i've actually done improv but it's like a, a like a other choice other choice other choice is the name of the improv game where uh in a scene uh Improvise like whatever number of improvisers will be doing a scene together, and at any point a moderator can clap their hands and say other choice, and the the person who spoke right before or did something right before has to do something completely different, right? No matter what. So it could be something like you know, like two two uh, two characters in a scene. One goes, oh, I went to Starbucks the other day and got like a, a a latte. The moderator can go other choice, and got a frappe. Other choice. And got a snail, you know, and like go on, right? Like it forces you to sort of like, um, th the purpose of this game is to like force you to think on your feet and not be too attached to your ideas, right? Uh, and I think that if we treat like an X card, uh, in that regard, it can be a great way for newer or more inexperienced GMs to grow as well. Because if a player X card is like a decision you made, you're kind of forced to think of, of something else. And I think that encourages a culture of player agency as well, uh, where the GM doesn't, you know, isn't too married to their ideas, you know what I mean? And like allows them creativity and allows opportunity for their players to contribute to the story as well. Um, yeah. So if those are all the questions that we have, uh, I think we can move on. Um, Jacqueline says, other choice sounds like a fascinating playbook move for a TTRPG. It is. I honestly, that's a good idea. I'm going to be jotting that down, Jacqueline. I might be putting that in a uh, God Killer or something because uh, that is... That is actually, that could be a really fun um, uh, move for a player to have against the GM, right? Uh, <laughs> like a resource they can burn to kind of be like, other choice, you know, like something else is in this room or like someone else, right, is driving the bus or like we're in a different city. That could actually be really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to write that down. Thank you for bringing that up, Shiok guys. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for tuning in. Y'all are great. Chiyakure is a sleepy origami. I really, really, really appreciate both of your presences. This has been my lecture on character death. <laughs> uh, I know the thumbnail is kind of ominous. It's like a bl back, black background and me smiling and it just says death on it, which I think is hilarious. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in. This has been lecture 13. Just as a reminder, um, Episode, the next episode of Transplaner is this coming Saturday, always Saturdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time, um, December 4th. I'm really excited about that episode because speaking of player agency, my players did something I did not expect them to do, which is run down to Tarnak and Kilohana's place. So I am excited to prep that encounter and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and yes, more moves that players can take against GMs. Equalize the playing field, bitch. Who's the GM now, motherfucker? Uh, I say as a forever GM. Uh, so 
love you both so much. And to those who are watching from the future, the VOD form, hello. Uh, don't forget to pledge to my Patreon if you got anything out of this. Uh, adventurers and above get to tune in live to Professor Chong's at the end of every month. I'm very excited to be continuing this lecture series and to be sharing more of my GM tips with the world. And of course, having a dialogue with um, uh, patrons in the chat, because that's always the highlight of these lectures for me. Uh, so thank you all so much to my uh, Patreon patrons. Uh, thank you to everyone who's watching from the future. Tune into Transplaner. Love you all so much and peace.